means that you have a contract with your for minimum wage and paid sick leave. You've got ADP or some sort of service provider that has your wage records. If you have spreadsheets that document and keep kind of paid sick leave documentation handy, if you've got you know your employee handbook and signature pages for employees who've signed off on it in a digital format, if it can be produced, generally that would be sufficient. And in the old days when people would submit banker boxes, and if I had my camera up, you could see the file cabinets behind me full of records. Uh, it's 2020, where possible, produce records on a zip drive if or when you get a subpoena request. That way we can receive your documents in an electronic format and print a lot less. Um, the Office of Labor Standards may request to see an employer's records as part of an investigation of a complaint. Um, there is a section in each of the ordinances regarding kind of on-site access. Investigators for the agency might be on premises at a restaurant doing a health inspection. At the same time, they might view that you do not have a public notice up for minimum wage or paid sick leave. That could be a, a substance of a violation filed at the Department of Administrative Hearings. Um, records can be kept in a hard copy or electronically. So we're going to go through uh, Fair Work Week record requirements, then minimum wage, paid sick leave. We'll talk about posting requirements. So just to kind of backtrack and refresh for those that are new to these weekly webinars, the Fair Work Week is really a scheduling ordinance designed to offer employees predictable schedules, compensation for schedule changes, the right to rest at least 10 hours between shifts, and protection from retaliation. That's just at a very high level. I would have put a period here but I can understand why there aren't. If you're interested in seeing any of our previous webinars, they're available on our website. Records must be re retained under the Chicago Fair Work Week Ordinance for at least three years and make them available to the Office of Labor Standards upon request, which would be a subpoena sent to the registered agent and or officers of the entity. Employers pr must provide employees uh, copies of their records upon reasonable request. That's just an internal policy. You can find this all in 125060. 160, I'm sorry, 060 is a totally different section. So if you want to follow along on retention of records, employers shall provide each covered employee a copy of the records relating to such covered employee upon an employee's reasonable request. I don't know that that's available in the minimum wage or paid sick leave ordinance. Namely, what, when we conduct an investigation, we would get a call via 311. We could get a form emailed to the BACP labor standards at cityofchicago.org inbox uh, we could get something that came through 311 via the shy 311 app we would be looking at uh, either an anonymous complaint or a complaint from a covered employee we would establish is this an employer that's covered um, and if we believed we have enough evidence to submit uh, a subpoena request we've got enough evidence to believe there might be a violation here then when we subpoena records one we want the name of each covered employee uh, under the subpoena now that could be at one location or multiple locations depending on what we learn in that initial complaint intake process and through interviews we need the mailing address telephone number and email address of each covered employee um, Sometimes we get handwritten responses. Uh, some people are better than others at it. A small business now, in the, under the Chicago Fair Work Week ordinance, you would expect 
given the size of the employers impacted and the industries, that it wouldn't be a handwritten document. However, we have seen some employers with 100 employees or more and handwritten documents uh, rather than spreadsheets with their mailing address, telephone number, email address in minimum wage investigations. We'd also be looking at the occupation and job title of each covered employee. I did an investigation personally where uh, I was calling employees regarding a paid sick violation. The owner of the company had listed himself as an employee and put his phone number down. He did not indicate his title. I talked to him. He's denied, of course, that there was any violation and had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't call him back and say, hey, man, you're the owner, okay? So could, could you be a little more forthcoming? Uh, subsequent to that, we opened up an investigation into both locations due to multiple minimum wage tip violations and paid sick leave violations by this particular, uh, let's call him a chef. Uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, that's when it gets colorful, when you're actually talking to people who've been impacted. And the, <laughs> so when we say, could you please put the title, if, you, if it's the president or CEO, you might just put that next to the title, please. Um, now, we would also want the hire date of each covered employee. Uh, that helps. Uh, sometimes we would look back to, the, in, in a minimum wage case, we look back sometimes to the inception of the act. Under Fair Work Week, we won't be going uh, prior to July 1st for violations, but it would help to have the hire date of each covered employee in an investigation because we require it. Um, we'll be looking at pay stubs, wage records, and or documents that show amounts paid and schedule of hours worked per week. Most companies keep, you know, ADP has wage records. It shows the hours, the types of pay, uh, any overtime, any tips in restaurants or other industries. Your classic, you know, pay stub helps. Some people just keep checks. It depends on the business model that you might have would kind of instruct what types of documents you produce. We request and receive documents, records, or information to demonstrate compliance with predictability pay requirements. So if people are offered work <laughs> less than 10 days and they receive predictability pay, what is uh, what documents show that it was paid or it was in compliance or there was or was not a mutual agreement between the employer, employee, or employees agreed to a shift change documentation regarding predictability pay requirements. Very helpful. Uh, records necessary to demonstrate the location of shifts where covered employees work. So, for example, you know, if you have a coffee, uh, a coffee establishment that meets the definition of retail, it's a covered industry, it's in the loop, it's got five locations, one on Michigan, one on Adams, one on Randolph, one on Lake, and there are shifts spread out over the course of a week at three different locations. Shift changes happen, you know, how and what records demonstrate the location of shifts where the covered employee works in an instance like that. If it's just one plant, you know, if it's a manufacturing plant, that could be, you know, plant A, plant B, plant C, a home office, or in the field, I don't know sure that's information that's already captured. It's just how do you keep that information and produce it upon request becomes important. Eight, the written consent of covered employees. Oh, I might have missed some Q&A. I haven't missed any Q&A yet. Great. Last time I was bogged in questions and answers that were pretty fantastic, I'll be honest. 
So I, I guess I'll just prepare for that later. Written consent of covered employees that work a shift that begins less than 10 hours after the previous day's shift or consent to schedule changes, agreements, modifications, or changes to work schedules. So documentation, evidence. Now, if there is a written consent, it, we have not provided a template that guides how you capture written consent. If that written consent is a text message in your industry and you can produce something in writing, it might suffice. What if it's a, a signature, if it's a, a check mark with initials, if it's whatever the documentation you as the employer or the worker can keep to document shifts that begin less than 10 hours, consent to schedule changes, any agreements, modifications, or changes to work schedules. Something to think about as uh, perhaps even in the onboarding and training of managers, how do we you know, how do we work through these requirements of the ordinance? How do we, are we in compliance? And what in 30, 60, 90 days down the road, do we have documentation to support the changes that were made and why we did or did not pay uh, consistent with the requirements of the ordinance? The numbers, uh, this, this will require some homework, I'm sure. Thus, you have a 30-day turnaround on most subpoenas. The number of employees employed by the employer globally, uh, if the number exceeds what is required by the statute and you wish to affirm that, rather than give us a total count, if you're not, then that would be sufficient. For example, there are certain fast food chains that might exceed the number globally, and that we don't need to know that there are you know, 22,442 as of midnight, Greenwich Mean Time, June 16. Uh, interestingly, the number of employees employed globally it might be one number, but let's say, for example, you are a Santa uh, your uh, restaurant that specializes in in holiday I'm not going to say Santa holiday events and you staff up. Yeah, that's globally. So outside of Illinois, Adam, uh, staff up and you would have enough to suffice to to provide coverage on the ordinance. But then after the holiday season, you would have no staff. So there might be coverage. There might be compliance with the ordinance during certain times of the year but other times, no. So the number of employees employ, employed by the employer globally would be very instructive on that. And then, you know, you have to think, depending on the industry you're in, hotels, restaurants, certain other retail industries, retail merchants association might be thinking, well, you know, we fluctuate and as we recover, uh, there might be times of the year where we would have covered employees and there might be times when we might not. There might be times when we could meet the definition of an employer based on the count of employees. There might be times when we don't. So these are things we would evaluate in determining do we have jurisdiction to receive the complaint and do something with it if it is uh, sufficient to go forward and file a case either at the Mayor's License Disciplinary Commission or the Department of Administrative Hearings. Um, all information to demonstrate compliance with proper posting of work schedules, including but not limited to electronic communication set to covered employees. So uh, if that means that, you know, you, you have a version that the public notice is posted in the break room in the traditional fashion, some industries work via app. And so an application might be sufficient to show that we provided the public notice or we posted the work schedule to the app and the person received it on such and such date. So you have to figure a subpoena's coming. How do we demonstrate compliance with posting of work schedules? Uh, so you'd have to look at that section of the ordinance. 
notice and posting in 125.090, every employer shall post in a conspicuous place in each facility where any covered employee works that is located within the geographic boundaries of the city, a notice advising the covered employees of their rights under this chapter. The commissioner shall prepare and make available a form notice that, suffice, that satisfies the requirements of A. B, every employer shall provide with the first paycheck subject to this chapter, a notice advising the covered employee of their rights under the chapter. The commissioner shall prepare and make available a form notice that satisfies the requirements of the subsection. Now this is July 1st prospectively. We won't be reviewing your publication of schedules prior to July 1st. We won't be reviewing them now. It's June 16, but after July 1st, after the ordinance takes effect, we will begin to review this information prospectively. Documents and dates necessary to demonstrate compliance with the initial estimate of work schedule, advance notice of work schedule, schedule changes, Offer of additional work hours to existing employees, right to rest, right to request a flexible working arrangement. These are things that you might, and I'm not here to provide legal advice, but we could subpoena this information and we're looking for that good faith estimate upon hiring. We're looking for that advance notice of work schedule. Uh, any schedule changes? Offers of additional work to existing employees, right to rest, right to request a flexible working arrangement. So maybe in the onboarding, you have a form that says right to request a flexible working arrangement. We have been looking at forms. Um, we have not published them yet. I'm a little wary of providing forms, but maybe we put up a draft only form. In some areas, um, just to give you a guide for those that uh, need it, it doesn't seem to be too complex. So we might provide some. We're right now we're totally engaged with minimum wage and paid sick leave and retaliation cases. So uh, the forms project is um, uh, it's a high priority, uh, but we have not published anything to the website as of this date. Um, your policy handbook and on subpoena I mean I, I don't we don't want the entire handbook shipped over uh, the employee manual or other documentation specifying employer policies and rules it might suffice to uh, have if it's a 600 page handbook if it's an electronic format or if you wish to scan those pages uh, relevant to the Chicago Fair Work Week ordinance and or any uh, signature pages where someone acknowledged receipt of the handbook. Think of your classic unemployment case where you were told these were the policies and procedures when you were hired and that was June 16 and on that day you were given a form and you acknowledged receipt of the handbook. Oh, I never recall this. Well, I, you know, I'll just move this document that you signed into evidence. <laughs> That's not my signature. You can imagine it's much like an episode of a, of a bad uh, cop show. Uh, what is that one? Law and Order. Yes, something like that. Uh, now, from the ordinance, if the commissioner reasonably determines that an employer is operating in violation of the ordinance, or any other applicable provision of the municipal code, the commissioner may issue an order in the form of a subpoena directed the employer to provide information, including about limited to the name, the address, details, sought. I mean, this is just really the substance of the subpoena. It comes from the ordinance, so I don't need to read all of it. It's a 30-day turnaround on subpoenas. If, however, and this is where the due process kicks in, if the employer files a legal objection, the commissioner shall provide a hearing on the objection within 10 business days 
as provided by rule. So uh, the employer community has the ability to object to a subpoena within 10 business days. Uh, we would provide a hearing on the objection. The commissioner's determination, and if there's a determination made, that the commissioner's determination shall be final and could be appealed in the manner provided by law. So you could probably take it to the circuit court. Knocking the rule shall be considered a limitation or restriction on the commissioner's powers and duties under 225 of the municipal code. It just gives, you know, if someone has a problem with subpoena, it's over, you know, let's say, for example, I exceeded the scope, not I, the office exceeded the scope of these things. And um, you were trying to work out a certain, you know, certain portions that would be responsive, could be trade secret or patented information. And uh, you've tried to work something out with the office, the office was not amenable to that, then you could file a legal objection to the subpoena response, get a hearing on it, and let's say the commission, yeah, just, you know, could you, sub, could you reply and black out those sections that you feel are patented or trademarked? Uh, if that was not sufficient and the initial order was issued, then you could go to the circuit court and further litigate the issue of your compliance with a subpoena. Uh, let's go to minimum wage. Any questions before I move on to minimum wage? And I hope it's not too technical, nor am I talking too fast. I haven't got a lot of questions so far, so I'm... Oh, I, I do have one question here I failed to see. I'll, I'll go through it now. It says, Sorry for the question, but just to make sure, if we have less than 50 covered employees due to COVID, we don't have to give notices or good faith estimate until we reach 50 covered employees. Yeah, if you're not, and that would, in, in the instance where you do not have sufficient employees to meet the definition of an employer, you would not have to comply with the Chicago Fair Work Week or ordinance. At a time when you crossed over that threshold, uh, I don't have it up in front of me, but to be an employer, you would need more. You would need under 125.020. An employer means a person who meets all the following employees globally, 100 or more, or in the case of not-for-profits, 250, 50 of whom are covered. So let's say you're uh, part of a franchise, um, Andy's Pizzeria, you know, Italian oven, Roman street style pizza. But in Chicago, you've got 25 employees. Globally, Andy's doing great. But in Chicago, Andy only has 25 covered employees. Then the ordinance would not apply. So that is, uh, that is, a, that is a good question. And I'm glad you asked. So we do have another question. Peter asks, reposting this to the Q&A section, if a schedule is revised, changed multiple times, should the employer save a copy of each version? Uh, they could. I don't know if we require it. I mean, I guess I could look and see. It would help uh, the timeline, let's say you changed it at 12 days, 11 days, 10 days, and then you change it at 9 days. Do you need to keep the 12 and 11? Uh, if, if you have one at 10, and now you're at 9 and 8, you might want to keep the 9 and 8. You might want to keep the 10. Um, so I, we wouldn't want to burden employers by keeping paper, but it depends. Uh, I don't know that the ordinance requires copies to be kept. I could look at it though. Schedule changes, if we go to the rules, <coughs> there might be a rule on schedule changes. You would think you were supposed to keep copies of changes. So if you go to Fair Work Week Rule 1.04 to answer Peter's question and schedule changes, um,
No, it doesn't require copies to be kept. You would think uh, from an evidentiary perspective, it would help comply with the ordinance to keep records. If we go back, you can see that, you know, we're looking for, if you're demonstrating compliance, you would have information related to schedule changes. So by inference, you would think you would probably keep them. Um, good question though. Consider for example, a worker was scheduled to work shift and is asked to work a different shift, but that change was reversed before the day of the shift. The end of the result is the same as the original schedule, but there were two changes. Um, you would think that schedule changes, I mean, you're required to keep records, documents, and dates necessary to demonstrate compliance with schedule changes. So keeping documentation as a practice, um, depending on hardware, software, paper requirements, and man hours or person hours, it just do people have the resources to keep everything? We don't want to overly burden employers. Demonstrating compliance with the ordinance would help. Let me see if I missed any other questions in the chat. I think I've got the questions so far. Oh, there's one to me. Now post your questions to the, I think if you post them to the Q&A, they come to all of us, all the speakers. Those are the questions I have. So. What is the minimum wage? And I, we've been receiving questions currently somewhere on the mayor's website. There was a portion that described an increase in the minimum wage if, uh, and it comes out of 124.020 um, section F, beginning on July 1, 2020, the greater of the minimum wage set by the minimum wage law, the minimum hourly wage, and there's this language about if the CPI increases by more than 2% in any year, the minimum wage shall be capped at 2.5%. And it goes on to say, uh, in that there shall be no minimum wage increase in any year with the unemployment rate in Chicago for the preceding year as calculated by the Illinois Department of Employment Security was greater to or equal, uh, greater to, was equal or greater to 8.5%, there would be no minimum wage increase. In fact, that section of the ordinance from 2017 was stricken and the minimum wage is posted on our website. It will increase in July to $13.50 or $14, depending on the size of the employer. Um, yeah, and the, the minimum wage questions, not that you asked, but I'll answer. <laughs> so, the questions we're getting regarding minimum wage, some there are some limited areas where minimum wage does not apply. There are very limited exceptions to the minimum wage. Uh, uh, things changed. There's still no, there's an exception if you have fewer than four employees, so then it defaults to the Illinois minimum wage. Um, Outside salesmen are not subject to the minimum wage. Member of religious corporation or organization, not accepted. If you work at an accredited Illinois college or university where the covered employee is a student under the Fair Labor Standards Act for motor carriers, camp counselors, um, and an employer may pay an employee who's 18 years of older during the first consecutive calendar days after the employee is initially employed, a wage that is more than 50% less than the wage prescribed in item one of subsection A, that's a very limited exception, for any governmental entity other than the city of Chicago and its sister agencies. So there's some very limited exceptions to the minimum wage. Um, 
And I'm not going to belabor the point here much more. Paid sick leave is phenomenally helpful to those that work hard and are in minimum or low wage jobs. The paid sick leave ordinance mandates employees accrue sick leave to use when they or a family member are sick among a variety of qualifying reasons. And the definition of family member is broad. Believe it. If you look at the minimum wage ordinance, you will see the definition in 124.010 is broad. I don't need to belabor that either here, and I won't. Records must be maintained for at least five years for minimum wage. Investigations could go all the way back to the inception of the ordinance. Requirements for minimum wage and paid sick leave are specified together, though there are additional specific requirements for tipped employees. Talk about that later. That's in the minimum wage rules in 1.06. Now, like in the Fair Work Week, we're looking for the name of each covered employee, mailing address, telephone number, email address of each covered employee because that's who we'll be calling. In a paid sick leave case, we will be burning up the phone lines where we get a pay stub that shows no accruals or accruals uh, and no paid sick leave paid out or days that people say, hey, I took that day off. You can see from my pay stub, I didn't get paid. We identify the pattern. We subpoena the records for all employees. At the Office of Labor Standards, we don't identify payment. Whereas in the Department of Labor, in certain claims, the claimant with his, with their attorney, I move away from gender identification, their attorney brings the case against the employer in a, like a one party versus another suit. In the Office of Labor Standards, the office like a prosecutor, brings it on behalf of all the employers, the community of employers, employees, I'm sorry. We're also looking at occupations and job titles. As I said, if it's the president of the company, put that on there, please. I'm not interested in calling the president, except to ask why there is a retaliation complaint pending and why people aren't getting paid, paid sick leave. We like to get right to work. I'm exaggerating for effect, but why not call the management of the company, especially in the area of COVID, we like to get right to the heart of the investigation and not delay. Some employers, we had an employer a uh, diner in the South Loop didn't pay large amount of their employees the last two weeks of pay. They had no cash. We issued a subpoena. They received a subpoena. We set up a phone call. They say, hey, we're really sorry. We had no cash. Since you issued the subpoena, and between now and then, it's like three weeks from the subpoena, we've paid everyone off. We're really sorry, and we're trying to rehire everybody who was working with us. So little mea culpa, they cured the issue, the administrative action hopefully will be cured so that we can avoid it altogether. Uh, Occupations and job titles of covered employees and whether they're tipped, non-tipped, or perform duties of both tipped and non-tipped. Some people are not real good in the minimum wage and paid sick leave of indicating in restaurants. You know, if you're a bar back, tipped, if you are a non-tipped hostess, if you're a tipped worker, it's not always evident from the spreadsheet of employees. And you can believe we're working all employees in the list. Once we establish a pattern, then we dig deep. 
hire date of each covered employee. That's important in minimum wage and paid sick leave. Um, date each covered employee was eligible to use paid sick leave. Upon a reading of the statute, how were they accruing and when were they eligible to use it? And then when did they use it? Number of hours of paid sick leave accrued by or awarded to each covered employee. Here's one thing that happens. No one has, you see a list of everybody in the restaurant or retail establishment or candy shop or ice cream shop, everybody's accruing sick leave, everybody's getting it. But when you look to the column of hours of how many people took paid sick leave, nobody ever takes paid sick leave year after year. So you have to wonder, did they just create a column in a spreadsheet to establish accrual? You know, right click and, and create a, a table that accrued based on hours and put it in there for record purposes? Or were people told they had paid sick leave and if they asked for it, did they take it off? People take paid sick days. So if they're taking them, document them and produce that information for us. Dates and numbers of hours each covered employee used paid sick leave. Here's what a really good employer did recently. We had an allegation that the person was denied paid sick leave and there was retaliation and there was a lot of bad blood between the employer and the employee. We subpoenaed the records. Nobody ever gets time off. They never pay. We had a very one-sided case. As an impartial arbiter of a decision, we subpoenaed the records. Employer produces the records, and lo and behold, there was a large volume of paid sick leave requests that were present and documented and initialed by the employees, approved by supervisors, um, over a long period of time. So there was a clearly a policy in place. There was a form that was used, and it looked like this one particular employee um, was not happy with the result and had some other alleged issues, uh, somewhere between the truth of the employer and the truth of the employee. There was a truth in the middle, uh, but we were um, struck with a body of evidence establishing that paid sick leave was a policy in place, and sometimes it was granted, sometimes it was denied, but there was pl plenty of evidence to document it, which helped us. Um, and it tied to the wage record. So we could see that when someone took off, then we could corroborate that through the wage record that someone was paid that day. And in fact, on the wage record, it would say paid, you know, it, it indicated the type of pay that was used. We're also very interested in rates of pay for each covered employee. We're not interested, we require it. We require hours worked each day and each work week by each covered employee. Sometimes the wage records suffice. If you have pay stubs that show the days they work and the work weeks they worked and their rate of pay in the pay stubs, that could suffice. I'm sorry. Um, we also look and request for the type of payment, if it's an hourly rate, salary, commission, Etc. If it's straight time, overtime, total wages paid to each covered employee in each pay period. Additions and deductions from each covered employee's wages for each pay period and an explanation of additions and deductions. A case we're working now. As restaurant workers paid a portion of their salary, 
in check, no deductions, and cash, no deductions. Um, if you could see my video now, you would see me wagging my head as, oh my, not good. So that might imp implicate more than an issue for the city to resolve. It could involve perhaps the Department of Employment Security with payroll deductions. It could involve the Department of Revenue, the Illinois Department of Revenue. Uh, it, 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 there could be uh, external referrals in an instance like that. Dates of payment of each pay period covered by each wage payment to each covered employee. Just your classic wage records. When you're in minimum wage and paid sick leave, it's really wages. Pretty straight ahead. Additional record requirements for tipped employees include the report received from the covered employees setting forth gratuities received during each workday. Some establishments have you know, now with everything with credit card, there's an amount that you know, you're paid the hourly wage and then they record the tips they make. If there's a gap in the difference, you would want to establish that, that the employer paid the difference. Employers are required to pay any difference between the tipped wage and the full minimum wage on any shift that happens. Um, the amount by which the wage of each such covered employee has been deemed to be increased by gratuities as determined by the employer. And I mean, that's, if you have your wage records that would establish that. Hours worked, wage records that include the tips. Hours worked each day in any occupation in which the covered employee does not receive gratuity. So, in some places, in certain restaurants, it's just broken down. They've got, you know, 10 hours on Monday as the hostess, no tips. T you know, day two, you've got a server, uh, and it just indicates each line the type of pay that happens, and if there's an overtime line, then it's in the wage record. If it's not in the pay stub, you should be able to produce it upon request. Hours worked, oh, sorry. Hours worked each day in occupations in which a covered employee received gratuities, total daily or weekly straight time earnings for such hours. These are things you probably already keep, so this shouldn't be new. There are the record requirements. This is just the same thing. You get a how to challenge a subpoena and what happens. Notice and posting requirements. Here is a copy of the newly minted notice with minimum wage and paid sick leave embedded in one document that could or should be posted depending on the industry you're in and a typical place like a break room. If it's distributed electronically, then so be it. Generally, if an investigator's on site at a restaurant, then we'll look for the posting if it's not there they will issue an administrative notice of violation. Business owners in Chicago know this. Uh, they've got health compliance, they've got business affairs and consumer protection documentation displayed as necessary per the statute. Now for the Fair Work Week ordinance, it's posted on the Office of Labor Standards website under the green Fair Work Week calendar icon. You can find specifics about it, 125.090 or the Fair Work Week Ordinance 1.07. That's in the rules. Uh, down below, it gives you the method for filing a complaint, 311, SHI 311, or through a complaint form that can be found on our website. Now, the notice must be posted in a conspicuous place in each facility where any covered employee works. Notice must be provided with the first paycheck subject to the ordinance. If you onboard packet it, great, congratulations. You must also provide it with the first paycheck subject to the ordinance. The notice must be provided yearly with the first 
paycheck on or following July 1st. It's a reminder to employees, hey, minimum wage applies, paid sick leave applies, did I get my minimum wage bump? It's also a, a reminder to employers, oh, wow, the minimum wage changed. We need to update our payroll system. Uh, it, I think what this will do is uh, avoid those instances where an employer and an employee don't realize until September that the minimum wage increased, which could result in a ton of violations. So the employee says, hey, I didn't notice my, uh, I looked at my pay stub. I was supposed to go from 1315 to 14. 1350 to 14. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, let me call over. I'm being, I'm using a little theater here for effect. Ideally, uh, you would know that the minimum wage changes each July and update the payroll systems. But in the instance that that was not happened, it would catch it sooner than later. Imagine if it wasn't done for six months, each week, each employee, actually each day, could be a $500 to $1,000 fine for the minimum wage violation. So this repeating it each July ideally avoids uh, just routine errors. Uh, that's really all I have. I probably went faster than I should have, but in the interest of time and economy, I covered those things I thought which would be necessary. James has a question, and while you all can read this, we've got our weekly webinars Tuesday and Thursday. This Thursday, we're going to be talking about the anti-retaliation ordinance. There are some wrinkles there. Uh, we can walk through each, uh, each of the sections. I look forward to having some, if not all, or more of you there. <laughs> Uh, to go through that ordinance, but let's get to James's questions, plural. James asks, under the right to refuse, am I correct in understanding that an employee can leave at the end of the schedule shift unless there's a mutual agreement to work the additional hours? So, uh, the right to refuse, yeah. Yeah, so if you want to say, hey, can you stay late and work more? Can you stay till 8? The person could refuse that. So yes, unless there was a mutual agreement to work the additional hours. So you offer them to me, hey, Andy, uh, with the grocery store, really busy. It's July 4th weekend. Uh, we had a couple people call off. Could you stay late tonight? You're scheduled till five. Could you stay till eight? Andy could say, no, thanks. I appreciate the offer. No, right to decline. I could stay and say, yeah, I'll stay, but I'm gonna need to be paid. Plus I want my predictability pay because it's less than 24 hours from the shift. You're adding hours. So under the Chicago Fair Work Ordinance, I want predictability pay, I stay. Or, yeah, fine, I'll stay. I absolutely love some hours. Do you need me to sign one of those mutual agreement forms, or is there some sort of thing we need to do under this new ordinance to demonstrate uh, and my consent in writing? Yeah, whatever, man. I'll take some more hours. Totally, totally. It's crappy outside. <laughs> this is great. Need some hours. Next question by James. This includes when, for example, a server still has his tables when their scheduled out time comes and the server can refuse past their scheduled out time correct. Now that's a little different. Uh, so that, if someone is scheduled to work a certain amount of hours, it, there is a healthcare exception for something like that where during a procedure, but there's nothing in, in the ordinance that discusses servers who fail to complete their shifts. So an employer would be wise to carefully monitor tables and work patterns so that there's a 15 minute overage that's fine, but if a person stays over 15, yeah, they could exercise their rights under the ordinance. I mean, that's all about 
displacing the worker. So the employer has a duty now to carefully monitor how they work. Um, I wouldn't put it on the worker, a refusal to work. The employer has a duty not to make this person stay late and interrupt their lives due to some inability to kind of manage workflow at the restaurant, if that helps. Any other questions? So the ordinance goes live July 1st. Let's get to that last slide. If there were questions you had, didn't want to ask, or were not able to ask, you could submit them to BACP Labor Standards at the city of Chicago.org, not the city. Uh, yes, Peter. Peter's question is, your last response suggested that a covered, employ covered worker wouldn't be due predictability pay for a last minute shift extension if they sign a form. That is in the ordinance, Peter, it's in the exceptions. Employers and employees can mutually agree to schedule changes. That's the ordinance that uh, clearly provides that. Uh, so if you go to Mena Fair Work Week ordinance, Schedule changes, 125.050. Exceptions, the requirements of this section shall not apply. D3, a work schedule change that is mutually agreed to by the covered employee and employer and is confirmed in writing. Uh, so that's in the ordinance. I'm not sure what your understanding was, but that's just right out of the ordinance. So if you have questions that were not asked or answered, BACP Labor Standards at cityofchicago.org. We're here for you. We'll be here Thursday, uh, and we'll be going over the anti-retaliation ordinance. We've also got office hours on Fridays. So I'm here Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday office hours. Office hours are more kind of open. I just pull up the ordinance and the rules and we just walk right to the ordinance. Um, the Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're trying to pick thematic units. Tony, yes, the recordings are available on our website, which is, oh, hold on. It is, well, I don't know it exactly, but if you type in, uh, Office of Labor Standards Chicago. It's at chicago.gov, the Office of Labor Standards. It's a really long title, but I think if you just type in Office of Labor Standards Chicago, it's readily available. Um, if you scroll down when you're on the website, uh, series of webinars. The first one, it's kind of orange with a book and a magnifying glass and a hammer. Uh, you should have put the scales of justice, but the hammer to bring some justice, that's where those would be. Does anyone else have any questions? Let me check my other area for questions. Uh, one last minute question for those that haven't yet to log out. Under what circumstances would a shift extension result in predictability pay if a worker has the right to decline and the right to agree to the change. So under what circumstances would a shift extension result in predictability pay? Uh, if an employee doesn't agree to it, so if you go to 125 B alterations, you get one hour of predictability pay for each shift in which the employer, A, adds work, adds hours of work, B, changes the date or time of a work shift with no loss of hours, C, with more than 24 hours notices, cancels or subtracts hours from a regular or on-call shift, two, no less than 50% of the covered worker's rate of pay for any scheduled hours, 
doesn't work. So if you cancel the shift out, you get 50% of the pay. So the second part of your question, if the worker has a right to decline, will they? If they decline the shift change, then they leave, or the right to agree to the change. I think you just have to look at 125 B1, A, B, and C. Adds hours, changes date or time with more than 24 hours, notice, cancel, subtract, regular on-call shift. Next question, if you don't agree, they have the right to refuse. But if they do agree, shouldn't they still receive a premium for the last minute change? Uh, well, if they are not agreeing to it, then they get predictability pay. So a mutual agreement is a contract to, that says, hey, I, I want the shift, but I mutually agree to the change. If you want the shift, um, but you want the pay, it's not a mutual agreement. You're just exercising your rights. So you either exercise your rights under the ordinance or you mutually agree to waive your rights under the ordinance. So maybe that's a different way to say the same thing. Uh, your comment there about um, this is how the ordinance was drafted through agreement of the parties. You have to think about employees. Do you believe that employees will waive their rights to predictability pay? If I told you if you stay late, you can agree to it or I can pay you $26 an hour. Do you think people will take $26 an hour or just stay? That's the gist of the ordinance is very powerful. It gives people rights they did not have. So employees will, I can imagine, would exercise their rights and receive the benefits of this amazing worker protection ordinance. If, however, people want to mutually agree to things, that's something they can consent to do. That's not for me to judge. Does anyone else have any questions? Any questions? Well, it's 301. I'd like to thank you for your time and questions and attendance. I hope that you feel free to join us this Thursday for anti-retaliation ordinance. If you've got questions, um, feel free to send me those to BACP Labor Standards at cityofchicago.org. I read most of them myself, unfortunately because our investigators are, you know, they are knee deep in retaliation cases, paid sick leave cases, minimum wage cases. So I try to monitor the email inbox. So try to ask informed questions so I don't have to work too hard to answer them in writing. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.